February 8th, 2023, morning session of the Portland City Council. Good morning, Keelan. Could you please call the roll? Good morning, Rubio. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Wheeler. Here. And before we move to legal counsel, uh, you have a new employee with you today, is that correct? Yes. Could you introduce your new employee? This is Aria. Aria. And, and Aria is the new deputy clerk? Uh, she's filling in while we're recruiting. She's filling in. Yep. Welcome. It's good to see you here. Thank you for being here. And Megan Lehman on this side used to sit on that side and now she is uh, my city council person here representing the mayor's office. And Megan has been here in the chamber for two years as Keelan's deputy. Um, she's still in the chamber so she hasn't gone far. Um, but she's now a member of my team, and we're, we're delighted to have her here and continue uh, this close-knit relationship that we have between the mayor's office and the clerk. And just since we have a, a pretty packed house today, people don't really appreciate the work of the council clerk. The council clerk uh, working here with legal counsel makes sure that uh, we continue to maintain the laws in terms of how we actually conduct our meetings, make sure that we remember to dot the I's, cross the T's. If I forget to call on people for public testimony, uh, I'm gently reminded. Um, if we do something wrong procedurally, I'm gently reminded. And uh, we, we really just can't do the work that we do here in the council chamber and certainly not as efficiently or effectively without the great work that, that the council clerk does. So we're, we're grateful to see you here. And Megan, it's great to have you as a member of my team, too. With that, we'll turn it over to our legal counsel, who also plays a very important role in keeping us all honest and out of jail. Uh, she'll read us the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. I heard. I certainly hope we keep you out of jail. Uh, welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before council in person or, or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the council agenda on the council clerk's webpage at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to speak briefly about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may, may be submitted at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. 
for testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in a person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Thank you. Uh, and colleagues, this is an important council day. This is, of course, Black History Month, and we will be having a presentation as our first time certain presentation at 945 on our Black History Month proclamation and celebration. Before we do that, we'll get to communications. Our first item on communications is 108. Please call the first individual. And I believe there's going to be a substitution of the individual, which, which I have approved. Thank you, Mayor. Request of Lynn Hanlon to address council regarding Zenith Energy new land use compatibility statement. And is it Annie? Yes. Annie, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Annie Capistani of Southeast Portland, speaking for Lynn Hanlon. I use the pronouns she, her. I'm a member of the Extinction Rebellion, 350 PDX, and Scrub the Hub Coalition. I will get right to the point. The city must rescind the LUX, also known as the Land Use Compatibility Statement, that was erroneously granted to Zenith Energy in October by Commissioner Dan Ryan. We must clean up the mess he made before Zenith makes a dangerous, deadly mess of our Willamette River. In addition to rescinding the LUX, the Scrub the Hub Coalition has two other demands. The city should immediately schedule a public hearing about the LUX and give Portlanders the opportunity to share their opinions on Zenith's operation. A, de a decision of such importance should have ample public input. And second, and this is directed to Commissioner Rubio, who unfortunately is not here right now, you are now overseeing the Bureau of Development Services. You have been a climate champion in the past, and we look forward to working with you to shut Zenith down. Our coalition has requested a meeting with Carmen Z Rubio, and we have not gotten a response. We have sent our questions via email, but we have not gotten answers. We had a brief meeting with Dan Ryan in January with a surprise appearance by Commissioner Rubio, but the meeting was dominated by condescending lectures from staff members and then was unexpectedly cut short. We still have no answers. When we get a, pro a proper meeting with Commissioner Rubio, we will have many questions and they all deserve answers. Here is a small sample of those questions. One, given impending earthquakes and possible derailments, how do renewable fuels address the dangers spelled out in the CEI hub seismic risk analysis? Don't renewables still burn, spill, pollute, and kill? And as a member of Portland Net, I'm particularly concerned about that question. The city's comprehensive plan has explicit language regarding community involvement, stating that the city works as a genuine partner with all Portland communities and interests, providing meaningful opportunities to participate in and influence all stages of planning and decision making. Knowing that tens of thousands of people have expressed their concerns about Zenith, why did the city make a backdoor deal with Zenith, betraying our trust and violating the comprehensive plan? How do the benefits outweigh the dangers of Zenith's exports for the next five years? What evidence do you have that Zenith is and will be in compliance with the comprehensive plan? The Scrub the Hub Coalition is here today to make sure Portlander's worries concerning Zenith's dangers get the attention they deserve. We are here because we refuse to be ignored. We are here to tell the city council that it doesn't matter who holds the gavel, the real power is with the people the voters, the taxpayers, the workers, the protesters, the old, the young, black, white, indigenous. The power is in the people's hands. Please stop banging your gavel and listen to the people. Thank you. Next individual, please, item number 109. And uh, Commissioner Rubio is present uh, virtually. She's not here in person, but she is, she is watching and hearing all of this. I want to assure you of that. Uh, next individual, please, item number 109. 
Request of Harlan Schober to address council regarding the importance of meeting city climate goals now. Welcome, Harlan. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Um, my name is Harlan Schober. I'm allied with the same groups as the previous speaker, and my comments also concern Zenith. I was in this room when the council voted to ban expanding fossil fuel infrastructure. And then I watched Zenith expand its capacity many times over, all without proper permits. Last year, when they needed a land use compatibility statement, you recognized that their operations, in fact, don't fit with Portland's plan, and you denied the Lux. Thanks for that. Zenith appealed, but they lost at every legal turn. Then, in what to many of us, I gotta tell you, feels like a sneaky move, you snatched defeat from the jaws of victory and granted the Lux. Based on the per their promise to convert to renewables in five years. Why? Regular citizens have to conclude that your real loyalties are somehow belong to big business. All the evidence and testimony from neighborhood associations, social justice groups, congregations and climate organizations seem to count for nothing. It looks like, and this is just how it looks from here, like your real marching orders come from the Portland Business Alliance and maybe from fear of Zenith's lawyers at Stoll Reeves. You say that issuing a Lux is a standard administrative function and that you're not required to involve the public. But frankly, that's disingenuous at best. There was a pattern of consultation and there was the expectation of an open process. You showed further bad faith on January 17th at our scheduled meeting with Commissioner Ryan. Our group had been strictly limited to four people. They were confronted with a room full of at least 10 city employees. Time was limited, questions weren't answered. It was more like they were there to be told how it was gonna be than to have a conversation. Please, stop trying to outmaneuver the public. You're supposed to work for us, not against us. The stakes are high. From Lac Magantic to Mosier to the unfolding disaster in Ohio, we know that rail tank cars derail and explode. Our own CEI hub seismic risks analysis is unequivocal. Fuel storage along the Willamette is a catastrophe spring-loaded and waiting to happen. We know that when profits come from weapons or tobacco or oxycodone or petroleum, corporations cannot do other than drive all of us over the cliff if we let them. Please stop caving into the big money, partner with your constituents and rescind the Lux. Last time we left singing we have got the power. And the mayor seemed a little bit uncomfortable with that. So today we depart in silence, but we have for you, uh, we present you with some symbolic toy gavels with messages on the back to, commemor to commemorate that occasion. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Harlan. We appreciate you being here and thank you everyone for showing up. Thank you. Next uh, individual, uh, sorry, Commissioner Maps. Uh, I just noticed sorry. That Rubio had to stand up. Oh, I apologize, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to uh, reiterate that, um, as we made clear in previous communications, um, we are, you know, we don't have the authority to rescind this. Um, the decision was processed in the same manner as every other Lux. Um, and for this reason, we can't create a special exception or procedure or a different process for just one application. Um, and as Commissioner Ryan made it clear last year, Zenith will be expected to maintain compliance with full transparency. <laughs> 
and to ensure the agreements are actualized. So that won't change. Um, and as it was referenced, you know, we brought, um, you know, we passed rules to permanently halt the expansion of fossil fuel storage capacity at the critical infrastructure or energy infrastructure hub. And we changed our renewable fuel standards to more rapidly increase the use of cleaner biodiesel and renewable diesel. So this is in alignment with the, the right direction that we want to go. And um, quite frankly, we support any entity that wants to step up with urgency to demonstrate to us with clear and permanent shifts away from fossil fuels and towards cleaner fuels. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, next individual, please, item number 110. Request of Jamie Dosher to address council regarding recreation contract. Welcome, Jamie. Jamie was gonna join us in person today. Is Jamie here? Jamie, are you here in the chamber? I don't see Jamie. We'll move on to uh, item Bob 111. Do we have uh, item number 111? 111. Yeah. Request of Brett Friedrich to address council regarding Bureau of Development Services and housing Excuse crisis. me. Excuse me. I'm, we're going to take a, we'll take a five minute recess. of Brett Friedrich to address council regarding Bureau of Development Services and housing crisis. Welcome, Brett. Hello, my name is Brett Friedrich, and today I'm speaking on one of the challenges that prevents affordable housing from being created in Portland, the permitting process through the Portland Bureau of Del Development Services. I work for a local architecture and construction company that specializes in ADUs and additions. Almost all of our work helps increase the density of Portland and is for middle or low income level clients. Portland desperately needs housing at these income levels. However, most residential permits, such as building permits for ADUs, can take many months to be approved. Governor Tina Kotek has announced a statewide housing production goal of 36,000 new housing units a year. I am very concerned that the delay in permits being released will impact the ability of Portland to produce enough housing to counteract the suffering occurring around us. In addition, if we are not careful in creating the right system for permitting, it will mean that permits for very large residential projects will end up being an even greater percentage of the housing units created. This could end up funneling more wealth to top individuals and not making Portland more equitable. I believe that one of the best paths towards making Portland more equitable 
is to make it easier for middle class citizens to be able to develop multiple units on their properties as the housing units they can afford to build will naturally be of small personal and affordable scale. I believe that the Bureau of Development Services has an excellent program that can be adapted to allow for this kind of development. The Field Issuance Remodel Program, also called the FER program, from Portland.gov. The FER program was implemented in 2003 as a pilot guide, pilot permit guide program to serve contractors who perform recurring residential alterations, additions on one or two family dwellings and accessory structures to streamline the plan review and inspection process. From my experience, the FER program is the best way for smaller scale, equitable and responsive residential development to occur in Portland. Most building permits are able to be approved within a month of the application date. I recommend that the city council propose to the Bureau of Development Services an expansion of the FER program to include all types of housing under the residential infill project. This would open up the program to ADUs and smaller multi-unit buildings, such as duplexes and quadplexes. Thank you for your time and consideration. Brett, can I ask you a question? Uh, this, this is Ted. Um, this strikes me as a very reasonable strategy. Can you infer why this has not happened up to this point? I believe that the greatest challenging greatest challenge to implementing this is that the fur program requires a sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship between the contractor and the inspector and so this would likely require more inspectors and i do not know um, you know how much experience or you know what seniority is required to um, you know, reach that level of certification for the inspector to be allowed to uh, take a like a one on one approach to assessing the safety of a building. All right. Well, I and I, so I, and I, and and I I shouldn't ask you to be the expert on this. this that's our job, I guess. Uh, but l let me just put it this way: I I think this strikes me just as a top line smart strategy to at least look into. And uh, I see Commissioner Rubio has her hand raised, and maybe this is something she's already considering. Uh, Commissioner Rubio? Thank you. Uh, and actually, no, Mayor, I, I just took a note uh, down so that we will follow up on this particular recommendation, and I'm communicating with my staff already. Yeah, good. Thanks uh, for bringing it up. Yeah, Brett, th thank you. This is exactly, uh, this is very, very helpful public testimony because it's, it's, allowing us to look at something that, that frankly, I haven't considered. I'll, I'll just speak for myself. Um, but it, it just, it strikes me as a very reasonable thing to look into. Really appreciate you bringing it to our attention. And, and Commissioner Ryan shaking his head yes, too. Um, so thanks. Uh, we appreciate your, your bringing that to us, our attention. Thank you, of course. Thank you. Uh, next individual. Uh, we didn't get uh, Jamie back in the chamber, did we, Jamie? Jamie Dosher. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Where am I? One twelve. Correct. Yes. Next individual. One twelve, please. Request of Susan Freed to address council regarding light trespassing and nuisance behind Springwater Flats. Welcome. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, hearing my testimony. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with everyone today. Uh, so. Um, so yes, this is concerning the light nuisance. Um, so I, I wrote this out. Um, so this is in reference to um, a light nuisance that I've encountered while living at Springwater Flats in Selwood. Um, excuse me, I'm a little sick today too. <laughs> Apologize. Um, so my hope is that the city implements uh, standards for residential properties to reduce light pollution and protect, it, protect its residents from faulty excessive lighting. Uh, it seems that South Hillsboro has implemented uh, some residential light trespassing standards, and I sent this over to the council for their reference. Um, also, uh, International Dark Sky Association 
They're, they're also a useful uh, resource. They have a fixture of a, a fixture seal of approval program, which outlines uh, lighting components, uh, specifics based on their use and setting. So my hope is that eventually the city of Portland implements uh, some light trespassing standards similar to the city of Hillsboro. So essentially um, what compelled me to write this, um, so the owners um, behind my building um, at 1664 Southeast Tonino Street in Portland, um, they have floodlights which shine into the units of Spring Water Flats apartments and directly into my uh, second story unit. So I worked to find some resolve and I recently rented this apartment and since then I've tried to reach out to the owner of the property and their property manager to share uh, strategies to remediate the situation. So letters and advice on how to lessen the light intrusion. Um, uh, so going further, my hope was that after a few conversations and a letter to the owner and his property manager that they'd implement strategies, namely installing a motion detector, um, using amber colored lights, approximately 220 Kelvin, uh, using low brightness light, approximately 50, 50 to 450 lumens, or um, implementing fixtures that prevent light from trespassing beyond the property um, components like shields, hoods, and angling the light downwards so that it wouldn't stream beyond the property. Um, their argument is that it deters potential criminals, but I'm I'm not so um, sure that that is um, accurate. Um, so, so I'll wrap this up. Yes. Um, so the light essentially comes on before dusk, and and it goes off about about um, maybe nine a.m. So, yeah, it's. I, I'm just curious if if the city could maybe implement some type of standards for residents as far as um, the situation goes. Thank you. Thank you. And Susan, before you hang up, um, thank you for your testimony. Commissioner Rubio has her hand raised and she might be speaking to this. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, uh, Mayor. And and just and Mayor, maybe you can also if you have anything to add about the Dark Skies project, but we just the council just funded a Dark Skies project and we're commencing that work and it's going to be carried out by the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And Susan, we have your your uh, letter and we will make sure that we get it to the right uh, folks in the Bureau. So. Oh, I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Um, Susan, also, you just stumbled onto one of my pet peeves. I, I don't have a lot of them, but this is one of them. Um, I, I'm a fairly light sleeper, and I've never understood why people feel like they need to have a, a floodlight on a neighbor's house or building. That, <laughs> that makes zero sense to me, and I, I totally empathize with your situation. Mm -hmm. I, I get why the, the landlord or the building owner might want to have lighting on the ground adjacent to their building, uh, but why they, they would think it's okay to illuminate your second floor uh, apartment is beyond me. And so um, we will obviously continue to look into that. Uh, as Commissioner Rubio said, we, we have your name and your address, and I know that, that her bureau will follow up on this. Um, so thank you for bringing it to our attention. I, I am not familiar with Hillsborough's uh, uh, regulations, but I will educate myself on that. I will see what they are doing, and yeah. uh, to the degree I that there's common them. sense things, we should do them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for the sympathy, and um, I also included that Hillsboro link. Um, it's yeah, yeah. I included um, some useful resources in case the city council and and everyone would like to reference them. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Get well. All right, uh, that completes communications to, and we'll just uh, take care of the consent agenda. Has, have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? No items. Please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. The first time certain item, number 113. Proclaim February 2023 to be Black History Month. Colleagues, our next item, as Keelan just indicated, is our Black History Month proclamation authored by the City African American Network 
otherwise known as CAN. Commissioner Maps will now introduce the CAN leadership team members who've joined us today. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this morning I have the honor of introducing members of the City African American Network who will lead today's Black History Month presentation and proclamation. Now, of course, the City African American Network, also known as CAN, is made up of city staff who volunteer their time to advocate for fair employment opportunities for black public servants here in the city of Portland. CAN is also the primary organizer behind the city of Portland's annual Black History Month proclamation. And now I will turn the floor over to our colleagues from CAN. Um, please take it away. Good morning. Morning. So just gonna introduce ourselves here, CAN leadership. Um, I am Marvin Dean. To my left is Taisha McCool Riley. To her left is Ernie Jones, Jones Ernie. Gwen Thompson, and Ira Bailey. And to my right is Jarrell Hosley. And Melody Brooks is back there. Hi, Melody. Uh, so we have five members here that are um, active CAN leadership, six, six, six members that are active CAN leadership. And like uh, Commissioner Mapp said, we um, do this every year, at least for the last four years that I've been a participant in CAN. Um, good morning, I'm Taisha McCool Riley, I'm housed in Civic Life. I am the mental health program specialist for the city. Um, and as part of CAN leadership this morning, um, as we prepare to um, read the proclamation for Black History Month, um, and we uh, really speak to the theme for Black History Month, which is, which is the black re is resistance, um, I think that it's important for us to reflect um, as individuals, as a, as a society, as a community, um, to really just reflect on where we are, um, where we've been, where we would like, like, like to see ourselves going, and what it takes to actually get to that place and get to that place in an, an intentional and meaningful as well as impactful way. Um, I would also encourage us to resist, um, to continue to perpetuate the systems that continue to um, marginalize, suppress and oppress um, the black experience and the black voice and black elevation. Um, and then I encourage um, those who, exp who are uh, part of the black community to, to persevere, to push forward, um, to continue to um, really call ourselves to a higher place, uh, regardless to the circumstances circumstances that we often endure daily um, as black people. And I will pass it on to Ernie if there's anything you'd like to say. Uh, Ernest Jones, Bureau of Emergency Management. Um, uh, no, that's I, fine. Am I reading my second? No, no, nope. no, nope. no, you're that's just all I have turn. to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I think, I think we can uh, move forward. Yes. We're passing it back to you. Oh, very good. <laughs> Yes, sir. No, 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 no. All right. no of, of just that. that the uh, introductions? Section. Yes. Okay, great. And yeah, and we'll come back at the yes. end and read the proclamation. Yes. Um, so at this point, I would ask my colleagues oh. the comments they'd like to make. Excuse me. Sorry, Mayor. Yeah. Thank you for having us uh, <laughs> for this opportunity. <laughs> we are going to, we have one more thing that we want to have as part of our presentation. Okay. I'm in the okay. back because I'm checking on the food downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, that's very important. And he has to run a show with him. Um, <laughs> But for the first time within city council chamber halls, I am super excited. We did this, uh, I think two years ago, but it was on Zoom. Um, we are going to have the black national anthem sang here in uh, council chambers. And that is by the wonderful Kimberly Cole. Also a uh, city employee. Yes.
dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to follow that. Who wants to go next? <laughs> I can go in any. Commissioner, Commissioner Gonzalez, I'll go ahead and go last. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Maps, you, uh, I'm, I'm Commissioner just have very brief comments today. I just want to thank Ken for um, all their work they uh, did this year and every other year to help make the Black History Month proclamation uh, um, happen. We really appreciate your work, not just on the item that we're dealing with today, but um, uh, I really appreciate your advocacy on behalf of black employees here in the city. I want to pledge uh, my commitment to work with you and partner with you to continue to make uh, conditions uh, for our, our our employees of color better. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, thought partnership and your leadership in this space, and we're really glad to see you here today. So thank you very much, and with that, I'll turn the floor back to Mr. Mayor. Commissioner Gonzalez. Well, I just wanted to thank you, Ken, for today's uh, presentation and for the work you continue to do on behalf of year-round, not just today, year-round, for uh, African-American employees by highlighting their experiences, their lived lives. Uh, let's, this month, let's celebrate Black History Month, not just in words, but with our actions, by supporting black-owned businesses, by restoring the safety and livability to our neighborhoods uh, across Portland. Let's make sure our black businesses are being supported with technical assistance and having access to contracts at the city of Portland to create a level playing field for Portland's black entrepreneurs. For all the hard work ahead of us, that's required to restore Portland's safety and livability. We need to engage with our communities across the city, including the black neighborhoods, black communities, at churches, businesses, and be responsive to their concerns as a city. And then let's do it again in March, April, and May, not just in February. Uh, every month, because this can't just be a one-time deal, a one-month deal, but a permanent part of who we are as a city in Portland. And that's raising all voices. And, and to this, today and this month, we're celebrating black voices. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Commissioner Gonzalez. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, uh, colleagues, for bringing this uh, forward, and Can for bringing this forward, and all the work that you do today and every day, um, and for your presentation. Um, I really want to lift up and appreciate your leadership, Can, uh, for this past year, and particularly for continuing to provide a safe space for um, our city's Black employees. Um, who, despite our best intentions, do not always feel safe at work, and also for speaking truth to power and for highlighting the systemic issues that have plagued this city and this country and um, Black communities since the beginning of time. And um, I want to acknowledge that there are longstanding and disproportionate impacts of racism and anti-Black policies and systems, um, that, you know, the impacts of that on the Black community and Black people. Um, and as public stewards, it's our responsibility um, uh, to take our role in these systems. Um, and when we learn about it, we name it and we take action uh, to transform uh, these very things that perpetuate these, these inequities. So um, I want to thank our Black employees for their service over the past several years, and especially during these challenging times. Um, we see and acknowledge your unique experiences, and my team and I will continue striving to do what is in our authority and um, me as a person to interrupt and strengthen and rebuild systems in order to enable Black people and Black communities to be seen and valued and thrive in Portland. So thank you again for everything you do and uh, for making the city um, a better place that it is. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, brevity is a leadership skill, and Taisha, you just got to the heart of the matter, so thank you <laughs> for that demonstration. Um, I also have to acknowledge um, Ms. Kimberly back there. Um, I did take a picture and send it to your dad. Um, <laughs> been knowing you for over 20 years, and wow, you're so, um, it's amazing. So, a little of my feelings just watching you perform. 
Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, Black History Month provides all of us an opportunity to reflect, and that's what we should do on the contributions and the sacrifices they have to go through to get to those places of being a person who can contribute. So many more obstacles than I could have ever understood. And so I just want to acknowledge that it's, it's, a, it's a time to celebrate that resilience and that strength and the impact that you've had. When I think of the African American experience, it's, it's, I think of arts and culture, of course, but I think of science and technology, which I don't think gets lifted enough. And of course, activism and leadership, but it's also um, military, armed forces, um, government first responders. Um, the African American community has always been um, in those positions, providing leadership and providing strength and resilience for all Americans. And, uh, and for me, because of my time spent with children and youth, it's always in the, ed the educators. And I know my educator friends who are black uh, really need this month to be lifted. But the good news is today, the children are getting a much more honest uh, history. It's just honest history. Um, and they are teaching it not just in February, thank goodness, but throughout the year. And if their school district isn't doing that, then of course we, we have to keep a watchful eye. Um, one of the best moments this past year was actually seeing PPS uh, change the name of the headquarters at PPS from the Blanchard Building to Dr. Matthew Prophet. As you all know, he was an amazing superintendent. He was there for 10 years, single-handedly increased the number of African-American teachers and staff. I think it quadrupled in his first couple years. And that, um, that's a big seed that was planted. And yes, um, Dr. Prophet needs a lot of, um, it deserves that attention. So I'm grateful that that, was, uh, that reckoning took place over this past year. And I was honored to be a part and supportive of that. So, um, but also I want to turn to my colleague, Commissioner Maps, because I think you're the fourth, is it the fourth African American to serve on our city council? And uh, not only are you our infrastructure city commissioner and um, hold us accountable to that like nobody's business, um, you're also a really active parent. In fact, um, you cut me off for good reason because you're in between child drop-offs in the morning. So uh, the fact that you're a black man raising two black sons is probably the most, I know it's the most important thing you do and you don't talk about it a lot, but you just do it. So I just wanna let you know how much I honor observing you as a parent. And uh, I'll, I'll end with uh, my favorite author and he really has been my favorite author for a long time. And one, cause I lived in Harlem in 86. I know it dates me. And uh, uh, William Baldwin's memorial service took place just two blocks from my house and it's a day I'll never forget. It was absolutely beautiful. And I already had read a couple of his novels and every time I read them, I have to reread I have to reread sentences and paragraphs over and over again, because he was deep. I mean, there was so much economy of language in everything that he wrote. So for those of you out there that haven't read a James Baldwin novel, get with it. Um, what I like, um, there's so many quotes that you could do, but this one rang true today. And my staffer, um, uh, Darian Jones, um, it really lifted this quote out. So thank you, Darian, for serving our city on a daily basis as a strong um, African-American man. The paradox, here's a quote, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. I'm humbled to be a part of today's proclamation. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. And I'll, I'll add my voice to uh, our thanks to our city employees. This has been a very, very difficult period for all of our city employees. And they do tremendous work in this community. And I don't need to say that it's thankless. And I also hear from our employees of color, particularly our black employees, that there are extra impediments to being successful and that we have a duty and a responsible responsibility here to provide adequate support and the tools that, that you and all of our employees need to be successful. And I want to acknowledge that you're not just people in the community who are passionate and caring about the community, you're also part of the city of Portland team. And the strength of that team spirit has been tested over the last several years. And I want to thank you, each of you personally, for the commitment that you've made to strengthening all of us through your leadership. So I, I, I just want to start by saying that. 
speaking more broadly, obviously black Portlanders have made huge contributions, not only to this community, but to this nation. And we want to make sure that we continue to support a vibrant culture here in our community and make sure that, as my colleague said, we also support shared economic prosperity through supporting nonprofit organizations that work with communities, supporting small business owners and operators as they struggle in a very challenging business environment to be successful, and also acknowledge that there's a lot of reconciliation that has to happen across the board in, in every aspect of life. And I don't need to tell you more. You know about health care disparities, you know about educational disparities, you know about disparities in law enforcement, and the lists go on and on and on. And there are days when it feels like we have not made much progress. And I see Black History Month as an opportunity to celebrate where we've come, but also as a reminder that we're, we're definitely not there yet. And none of us succeed if the black community doesn't succeed. It's In many ways, really the center thread of our American existence. It's um, it's about strength. It's about resilience. It's about getting up each and every time and continuing to lead. I also like to take this opportunity to thank some people personally. Um, this has been a very difficult year for me for a variety of reasons, and this isn't about me. I, I'm making this a larger statement, but I think about who stood with me during this last year. and. I think about the circumstances of those individuals who stood with me, and I think of Senator Avel Gordley, who has repeatedly stood with me over the course of the last year. And there are many reasons and excuses she could have used to not stand with me, but she leaned in and she was always there for me. I think of Senator Margaret Carter, who repeatedly reached out to me over the course of the last year and basically asked, how can I help? She's 87 years old. Mm -hmm. Is it? She, yeah, no, she's she 87. I don't know. Timeless. <laughs> she lives. She does. And, and she's inspiring to the community. Last but not least, my friend Margo. You don't know her. It's not important, but I do. And she's been there, and I appreciate it. So uh, I, I, I just, the, the long way of saying, maybe too emotionally, maybe too personally, this isn't just another proclamation. This is about who we are, who we are as a community, the contributions of our employees to this community, and unbridled hope for the future. And with that, I will turn this over to our authors and our presenters from Cannes who will read this year's Black History Month proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Whereas the city of Portland takes pride in joining Americans throughout the country in recognizing February 2023 as Black History Month and Whereas Black History Month recognizes and pays tribute to the contributions that African Americans have made to American history and their struggles for freedom and equality and deepens our understanding of just how intertwined our histories are and. Whereas the theme for 2023, Black Resistance, allows us a moment of contemplation and reflection on African Americans' fight against historic and ongoing oppression in all its forms, including physical, mental, academic, professional, legal, political, and social, and. Whereas blacks have found ways to operate outside of the system and foster hope within our own communities to promote and empower black people 
to persevere in spite of the intensity of white supremacy that we endure daily. And whereas we give respect and honor to those on whose backs were built the foundation of today's civil rights movements at the cost of their blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifice, sometimes figuratively and sometimes literally, recognizing the frequency of comparison to the black experience that many movements have relied upon and included in their narratives and Whereas the black voice refuses to be silenced. As a people, we will continue to rise, evolve, and elevate to higher heights and levels with no regard for the literal and figurative hurdles that have been set before us for generations. Our truth and our voices cannot be muted. Our voices are powerful, influential, and encouraging. And our truth writes the real narrative of the black experience and Whereas we recognize that many tools and weapons of oppression are designed to be self-inflicting and unfortunately were successfully distributed by the beneficiaries of black self-destruction from the time of the creation of the animosity between the house and the field Negroes to the drugs and guns epidemic that currently plague our communities and neighborhoods and is, and is exploited for profit and. Whereas the black community still experiences the trauma from a healthcare system that was developed on the premise that the Negro is less human than the white man, that mental health concerns in the black community were something to be either hidden or accepted, that emotional fatigue is communicated as weakness in relation to the idea of the strong black man and resilient black woman, and that the pursuit of spiritual health has been characterized as cartoonish, outdated, and irrelevant, and? Whereas we are a resilient people refusing to be victims and downtrodden, standing strong, uniting, and rejecting the systemic belief that we are less than and undeserving of humane treatment that includes being treated with respect and dignity as the minimum, and? Whereas we rebel against extra legal violence, systemic racism, discrimination, suppression, oppression, and any type and any treatment against the black di diaspora that neither honors us as a people nor empowers us to embrace our truth. Build ourselves up and have allies that reject the racist foundation that our nation was built upon and continues to perpetuate and Whereas the attacks on the black family have uh, been intended to harm the African American community, in many instances they have created deeper, more determined roots from which a foundation of incredible strength, resilience, beauty, creativity, love, and unity has grown, supporting growth in the areas of education, science, medicine, arts, sports, finance, politics, and... Whereas there are few, if any, things more beautiful than the loving touch of a strong black mother, the kind, encouraging words of a strong black father, the genuine respect and consideration of a strong, understanding child, and the African American is prepared to go to battle for what should be rightfully ours. This preparedness is a part of our narrative and has cultivated our courage, drive, resilience in the face of adversity and inequality, all of which is the identity of the black family. And whereas black resilience, brilliance, innovation, and power can be seen woven throughout our existence and will continue to rewrite the narrative of the black family and continue to break barriers, challenge the status quo, and create opportunities for our contributions to be highlighted and embraced and Whereas, we as a people are saying no more of the same. Our, hum our humanity matters, our struggle matters, our triumphs matter, our lives matter, and our black experience matters. Today we celebrate our blackness without reservation or hesitation, but with pride and honor and... Mr. Mayor. Now therefore, let it be resolved the City of Portland and Portland City Council do hereby proclaim February 2023 to be Black History Month in Portland and encourage our residents to observe this month. Thank, Thank you. you all.
really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and before we um, step away, again, thank you all for having us. And we just want to let everyone that there are, know that there is great food and um, goodies downstairs and some amazing artwork by African-American artists down in the atrium. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what time does that go to, the, the celebration? Yeah, 1230. Till 1230 p.m. today. <laughs> exactly. Everybody keep it tight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to our second time certain item, please. Item number 114. Amend planning and zoning code in accordance with the electric vehicle ready code project recommended draft to create regulations and standards for electric vehicle infrastructure. All right, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, this is the second reading, correct? Yeah. Uh, you're right. It is. Second reading. This has already heard a presentation. There's been public testimony on this item. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Sorry. I'd like to thank Ingrid Fish and Sandra Wood uh, for all of the excellent work uh, put into this, uh, this work to bring us to this final vote. Uh, today. I'd also like to acknowledge the Planning and Sustainability Commission for bringing forward um, this project. Um, this project will ensure that new residential development provides the infrastructure needed for future demand of electric vehicles, and it, it allows for a more equitably balanced expansion to those who would otherwise not have access to this infrastructure. And it also ensures that our new residential developments will have the adequate infrastructure as we continue the transition towards EVs in Portland. So I enthusiastically vote aye. Ryan. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, and thank you, uh, BPS team. There you are back there, take a bow. Um, colleagues, uh, by implementing these recommendations, Portland can remain at the forefront of electrical vehicle revolution and contribute to the fight against climate change by reducing the transportation sector's carbon footprint. This legislation to me is about access. Too often the emerging green economy is not accessible to the working class. This is a great step in that direction. Availability of EV infrastructure will attract business and investment to the city. <clears throat> Supporting Portland's electrical vehicle ready code project and its recommendations is crucial for creating a cleaner, greener, and more sustainable future for our city. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I did not originally anticipate having uh, much to say on this. I've historically been a strong advocate for electrification, uh, EV adoption. My household had an EV vehicle for a number of years, uh, traded for a bike for more exercise and a little bit of uh, ec household economics. Um, I, I do want to make a few observations on uh, the thinking behind this and as we approach uh, future code requirements that would impact multifamily. Um, specifically, so we're, uh, we're really at a forefront of a conflict at times between affordability and our responsibilities with respect to climate change. And I want to test some assumptions, just at a, or at least put them on the record with respect to climate change. Uh, I think many of us in the Portland Metro make assumptions that we have a great deal of energy coming from hydro. Uh, and while that's true, uh, we looked it up this morning, PGE is still 25% generated by coal as of 2020, uh, over 20% natural gas. Pacific Power is 46, uh, almost 47% coal at, as of 2021, and 18.4% natural gas. And so I think we need a level set um, as a community in embracing uh, uh, electrification while that feels like that's the future, uh, that continues to drive certain energy consumption that is suboptimal. Um, and I, I'm, I'm down with the direction, I just want that we're clear on that when we're talking about electrification over the short, medium term. Now I want to turn to affordability. I mean, this is real the real crisis of the moment for the city of Portland. And while the incremental impact of this ordinance or this change is, is fairly small, uh, particularly when you're looking at the difference between the state and the city standards, uh, I don't anticipate this is gonna significantly drive up uh, new development costs. And that's, you'll see how I vote here in a second. And that's ultimately how I get comfortable on this. But I do wanna document a couple of pieces here. 
Portland is far behind on producing adequate housing supply. The recent regional housing study need analysis showed that the metro needs 225,000 units over the next 20 years. And we're currently 60,000 units be underperforming towards that goal. This is a significant gap in the metro area. Governor Kotex, executive order establishing a statewide housing production goal. We are far behind that in the metro area. There is substantial work we need to do and every incremental decision we make, it needs to be with those in mind. I think we need, generally speaking, in the city of Portland to consider pausing new requirements that may add cost or complexity in the development of multifamily or any housing stock until we are on track to meet our long-term supply uh, goals. And that's a general observation that encourages us all to think about that. And again, this is an incrementally a small, is gonna have a small impact on cost, potentially a small impact on the permitting process, but it has been a, a death by a thousand cuts in the development of multifamily in the metro area. And uh, in recent years, many venerable goals have been pursued, but have incrementally driven up cost, have incrementally made it more difficult to get through the permitting process. Um, I think with that, I, you know, there are some other pieces that I'd like, hopefully as we're looking forward to things that impact multifamily development, uh, some assessment on the potential impact on reduced number of units for each incremental action. And let me be very, very specific. So the projected cost on this may be 1% on the overall construction cost of a multifamily development. But you add the 1% to the 1% to the 1%. Uh, you know, we've just did the bird safe glass, um, the PED PDX, the inclusionary zoning all good things, all trying to do good things in, in the community, but each of those incrementally drives up cost and complexity. And I would just like us to think about that. Can we quantify the impact on the number of units generated with each of these incremental uh, steps? Again, ultimately, I don't think this has a significant impact by itself, but it is part of a broader issue that I'd like us to keep focus on. With that, I vote aye. Max. Um, I want to thank Mr. Rubio for her leadership on this item. I also want to recognize and uh, express my appreciation for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability uh, for, their, for their work in this important space. I want to also would like to take a moment to recognize the work that uh, PBOT has done in partnering with BPS. Um, to uh, figure out how we can uh, build an electric future. I think um, I hear the concerns uh, raised by my colleague uh, um, Renee Gonzalez around uh, the trade-offs between building affordable housing and, um, and building towards a green future. Um, I believe that it's possible to strike a, a, a right balance between uh, the two. I think that our future is electric, and this is an important step in that direction. Um, if we move towards electric, I think we are in a much better space to achieve our climate goals. Um, I want to state that uh, I and PBOT are going to be deeply committed to helping make this future a reality, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why in the coming months, PBOT will bring an ordinance before uh, this council, which I think may address some of the concerns raised by uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, we'll bring forward a proposal to bring um, EV charging to the right of way, um, which allows folks to engage in this new technology without adding costs to uh, new multifamily housing. Uh, I look forward to um, introducing this idea to this council and to the public in the coming months. But in the meantime, I vote aye. Wheeler. Good work, Commissioner Rubio, and uh, to your team. I think this was a very reasonable and pragmatic but important step forward. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item 115, a report. Accept the Year 7 Bond Oversight Committee report on the $68 million 2014 Parks General Obligation Bond. Commissioner Ryan. Yes. <clears throat> Colleagues, uh, let's see. There we are. To recap. When the parks replacement bond passed in 2014, which is almost a decade ago, and the ballot measure called for an independent oversight committee, and last week we heard from the staff's overview on this, and today we'll hear from the community uh, committee. In keeping with that measure, the bond oversight committee was established in 2015. Members of the oversight committee are appointed by each council member, and they represent the Portland community. 
The purpose of this committee is to review the work of the Portland Parks and Recreation in carrying out the promises and projects of this bond measure. The committee report being presented today was created in response to the seventh annual report on the Parks 2014 General Obligation Bond that I just mentioned that was, of course, last week. Hello, Robin. Uh, let's see, the report is based on independent research and analysis that includes program evaluation and recommendations for moving forward as a bond program completes their work. I know this is really just phase one as we dig out of decades and decades of neglect and we are off to a good start. I'm thrilled to introduce committee member David Stazek. He will be representing the hardworking Portland Parks Bond Oversight Committee and he will ensure us that our tax dollars are being spent with integrity as the voters wish. And here you are, David, to tell us more about it. You're remote, is that correct? I am correct, that is correct. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Take it away, David. Can you see me too? Am I able to be seen there? I yeah. see you, yeah. Awesome, so we're almost almost face to face. Hello, everybody. Mr. Mayor, members of council, good morning. My, my name is David Stazak resident of Southeast Portland and the chair of the community-led Parks Replacement Bond Oversight Committee, and I'm very happy to present to you today our annual report for the 2021-2022 fiscal year and give you a brief summary of the report. Um, Commissioner Ryan just did a great job of bringing up to speed on the, on the bond that was passed in 2014. Um, and again, this is the seventh year of us uh, creating this report. Uh, back to you folks. Um, the Oversight Committee continues to receive regular updates from Portland Parks and Rec staff and meetings are currently held remotely by video conference and in person, even at recently completed projects or even projects under construction. So that's been a treat. And additionally, information is uh, received via emails and on the Parks Bond Replacement website. The other three members of the committee are Carl Chang, Karen Loper Tracy, and Brianna Weston Scow. Uh, this is the seventh year the Bond Oversight Committee has the privilege of submitting its report to the mayor and the council. Uh, the committee would like to share our heartfelt appreciation for all the PPNR and our staff and for the bond and what the bond program has done to keep our city and its amazing parks here for us these last few years. Through a pandemic, through extreme weather events, the parks have remained here and operational for all Portlanders. 2022 was a significant year for the bond as two major projects were finished and the final project began construction. As an oversight committee, we're charged with three specific categories or objectives as it relates to the original bond. The first objective is adherence to the language uh, of the bond. The second is fiscal accountability. And the third is transparency. For objective one, adherence to the bond language, the voters approved the bonds to fix playgrounds, improve park facilities, improve park safety, and improve park accessibility. Specifically, the funds are for repairs and other capital costs, not operational expenses. As we complete the seventh year of this bond measure, 51 of the 52 identified bond projects are now completed and the last remaining project, the Mount Tabor Yard, will be completed this year. So a kind of a round of applause that we're, we're almost there. Uh, the criterion has been and continues to be met. The Bond Oversight Committee receives regular updates for review and is confident that the costs are appropriately spent. Three bond issuances were made and an audit of the bond program performance was completed in 2019 confirming this objective continues to be met. For objective two, maintaining fiscal accountability as a core driver of the parks replacement bond, the dollars are clearly and separately tracked to ensure integrity and accurately uh, of all financial statements. PPNR remains fiscally accountable of bond dollars with a separate tracking system accessible to all staff and administrated overhead is lower than 10% of the total budget goal. Budgets are on target in all categories except for pools and maintenance yards currently. Highlights of some of the fiscal achievements have been that 40% of the value of all bond construction contracts have been awarded to disadvantaged business enterprises, minority owned, women owned, emerging, emerging small businesses and service disabled veterans business enterprises. 31% of the value of all professional services awarded to bond projects were awarded to those COVID approved firms, far surpassing the original targets of 20%. So another hats off for that. Moving on to objective three, transparency. The PPNR board, uh, bond team has demonstrated transparency and accountability in several significant ways. Firstly, by issuing annual reports, which are available all online. And this year, the executive summary is also in English and in Spanish. Secondly, the full performance audit and completed in 2019 is also available online and its findings demonstrate that the bond program has been successful in delivering on the promises made to the community measure 26159 and in Council Resolution 37085. 
Lastly, as more projects are completed and the final project finishes construction, the bond community engagement staff have focused on providing regular website updates, construction signage, and social media posts about ongoing projects. The Bond Oversight Committee would like to congratulate the PPNR bond team on its success in the last seven years, and the finish line is definitely in sight. Like last year's report, we'd also like to recommend a final performance audit be conducted after all the bond projects reach final completion and its findings be submitted to the Bond Oversight Committee and the City Council. We'd also like to suggest a final public survey and staff survey be taken to gauge the overall success and awareness of the lasting efforts of the 2014 Parks Replacement Bond. It's my pleasure and privilege to serve on the Parks Replacement Bond Oversight Committee and to present our annual report to you, Mr. Mayor, and our distinguished council members. If you have any questions or comments about the report or this presentation, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Colleagues, colleagues any questions? Nope, I think we're, we're good. This is a report. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So Except. moved. Oh, I apologize. Look, I, I got it ahead of Kia. Yeah. It was close. <laughs> do we have any public testimony? We don't have anyone signed Very up. good. Commissioner Maps moves. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll on the report. Rubio. Thank you, David, for the report and for your continued leadership and dedication to parks and recreation. Really appreciate your, your time on this important committee. I'm very happy to vote aye. Ryan. Thank you, David, for your time and expertise and ongoing support of Portland Parks and Recreation and extend the gratitude to the entire committee that you mentioned. I'm grateful for their depth of experience and wise counsel as well. This is just a start as we have over 500 million in deferred maintenance. Parks assets are sacred to our city and we must do all we can to never let them perish. I'm happy to vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Yeah, I want to thank David for that excellent presentation, and the contents of the presentation is also really reassuring. This is a good news report. I'm happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Uh, two items I'd like to point out about this report. Number one, uh, there is citizen engagement and citizen oversight involved in this important process. Number two, I would like to point out that the Parks Bureau has been relentlessly accountable with the dollars that have been entrusted to the Bureau. And that somewhat counters a popular narrative that's out there nationally about the inability of local government to either listen to the public or take into account the needs of the public or to be accountable to the public. And I'm really pleased with the hard work that the Parks Bureau has done here to score top points in both areas, both engagement and accountability. And uh, so I just want to give you guys a shout out for the hard work you've done. Really excellent work. I vote aye. The report is accepted. Next item, please, we'll go to the regular agenda. Item number 118, please. Accept a bid of more excavating incorporated for the Penn Ridge water mains for $2,084,915. Colleagues, this is also a report as part of Partland Water Bureau's Penn Ridge water mains project. This report authorizes work to replace aging, poor condition, and undersized infrastructure in the area. We could make some jokes about that, but we'll just move on. This project will install approximately 4,000 feet of new ductile iron water main, review 41 household water services, and install seven new fire hydrants. Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor is here to walk us through the report. Good morning, Biko. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and members of City Council. For the record, I'm Biko Taylor, the Chief Procurement Officer. Uh, on April 13th, 2022, Council approved Ordinance 190772 for the, Pen for the Penn Ridge Water Mains Project. Uh, at that time, the engineering estimate on that project was 1.4 million, and they were pretty confident that that um, was an accurate assessment. However, prior to bid, additional scope was added to reduce the impacts of construction to the local community surrounding that project. On October 12, 2022, Procurement Services issued an invitation to bid, and the due date was November 10, 2022. We received two bids in total. This was a low bid methodology, and more excavation was the low bidder. Their proposal came in at $2,084,915, which is 48.9% above the budget, above the engineering estimate. The city's standard 20% aspirational goal did apply to this, this project, 
And the following is a breakdown of the utilization that just bucket, I'm sorry, um, that more excavation uh, submitted. 79.6% will be self-performed by more, 20% by certified COVID, and 20% by certified COVID subcontractors. Um, as a moment of transparency, I would like to, you know, always hold myself accountable. Um, we didn't really hit the mark on MBE um, participation on this project. Only 4% of this project will go to the uh, black or brown community. I want to acknowledge the low, uh, low bid methodology continues to provide barriers in that area. And I just want to be transparent to council that we didn't, we didn't hit the mark on this particular project, although we did make the city's quote unquote aspirational 20% mark for COVID certified firms. More excavation is located in Fairview, Oregon, and is not a state COVID certified contractor. They have a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. Funds are available in the FY23 budget, and um, the Bureau has requested funding in the FY24 budget for construction, inspection, and management of this project. If there are any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer them now. Thanks, Director Taylor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a quick question. Uh, Director Taylor, thank you for um, that presentation and thank you for the, your work on this project. Um, you mentioned that the low bid uh, methodology we used here was a barrier towards uh, achieving our minority contracting goals. Is there a fix for that? Well, at the legislative le level, there could be. Um, you know, in this state, we don't provide. Um, benefit based on the accounts of race. Um, locally at the city, we do not um, have leverage in a low bid environment where we accept price as the, the mitigating factor. So we don't assess bidders on um, the merits of a uh, minority plan, MBE plan. It's essentially, this is the market, right? We accept the lowest bid. And so that unto itself provides a barrier, right? So. Um, there are methods to incentivize low bidders, um, strictly through the fact that we're, we have inclusive contracting efforts, we have tactical efforts, and of course we have um, new uh, policy and ordinances uh, given to us by council in April to try to you know, um, increase the amount of participation on low bid projects. So that's my answer to the question. It's not necessarily the best answer, but that's just the environment. Low price wins in this environment, and we, we have little leverage there. Uh, Director Taylor, thank you for that explanation. I don't blame you for the uh, environment that we operate in, although I will say to my colleagues, I think certainly over the course of 2023, I hope we can find space to think about this structural problem that we encounter fairly often. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, that completes the questions I have. Very good. Uh, any further questions? on this report. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thanks for being here, uh, Director Taylor. Can you explain a little, so you said it's, it's we have to go through the state, it's a state statute that would have to change? Well, I think it's, you know, as a matter of if, you know, the topic is do, is there legislature that would allow us to provide um, priority weighting um, on the basis of race, right? So our goals are aspirational at the city of Portland and not firm goals. Um, we have, you know, peers in the United States, Baltimore, others that have firm goals that are set um, that we that you know bidders have to abide by. Here we have aspirational goals; they are not firm. Um, I believe there are several at the legislature le legislative level laws that can uh, that can assist us with um, providing and lowering barriers um, in a low bid environment here in the state of Oregon. But again, that's out of our purview. We do our best here at the city of Portland. We have aspirational goals. We do not have firm goals here in the state of Oregon. And there's so many other factors you could play into this as opposed to just low bid. Um, most definitely um, the availability. You'll, you'll probably hear from majority you know, white Caucasian owned firms. That in, many, in many cases in a low bid environment, they do not have um, partners, you know, sufficient partners, but again, that's two sides of the coin. Our minority community will disagree with that vehemently. Some of our strategic partners, PBDG, NAMAC, they, will dis they would disagree with the premise that there are not enough um, subcontractors to, to compete and provide pricing. Clearly, um, in the market, you, you, you probably hear 
majority owned firms state that there's a premium cost to subcontract with minority firms typically because their prices are higher. Again, um, you know, our minority business partners will probably disagree with that. Um, many factors in play there, access to capital, access to economy, leveraging economies of scale with materials that some of our smaller subcontractors do not have access to. So again, it's the market, the market wins, low price wins here. Um, but you know, we are working vehemently and we're working strategically with our partners to, to, you know, to bring more competition, bring more viable minority candidates to that market that can provide low price solutions for those majority owned subs. Thank you, I appreciate the dialogue on this. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Maps. Sure, um, Commissioner Ryan, thank you for this question and uh, Director Taylor, thank you for, for that explanation. Uh, the conversation we're having today um, makes me want to um, have a conversation between probably government relations, um, the public works bureaus, because I work with them quite closely, and any other bureaus that um, are operate in this space to see if we can find maybe um, a legislative fix that both provides equity in contracting and um, a good value to the taxpayer. Um, and if, Mr. Mayor, if you'd be open to uh, uh, helping me pull together a table like that, um, I'll certainly be there. Great. And I just have one more. Commissioner Ryan? Yeah. Thank you for that. And I, and I hope just to conclude that for this moment, um, that we look at the assets of why we award to minority, business, minority, con minority contractors. So when we're looking at building generational wealth, so that we, we bring in the, the, the reasons to do that and how they multiply our economy for Absolutely. generations to come. And I know that you know that, mm -hmm. but I think that we have to figure out how to adapt the narrative a bit. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Um, this is something you can't do anything about, but I've only been on council over t uh, two years. Remember the first year, we had a lot of bids that were under the, the, the market, what we projected, and now there, there's a theme of being over 40%, and I know that you know why, so if you could just explain to the public why over the past year they've really escalated in that direction. Um, on this particular project, you know, it was a combination of two things, the scope, the size of the project changed as well. So we're paying for more, right? Um, but, you know, inflation has impacted material costs. Um, so if we look at CPI index, the Fed, what the Fed publishes, you can see alignment with, you know, particular, you know, cost areas, raw materials, aggregates, what have you, um, concrete, you know, the whole gamut. Um, costs are up 30, 40 percent in some, in some areas, right? So, you know, I, have, I, I can't estimate when that will change, but uh, we are dealing with breathtaking inflation um, in the area of material costs right now. Um, and then in many cases, you know, some of these estimates were, these uh, engineering estimates were made quite some time ago, right? And uh, in many cases, our engineering estimates are, are completed pre-design, right? So once you get into the design phase, clearly uh, that might impact scope. There's some uncertainty there, but by and large, um, just like you know, we're no different from any other major city dealing with high inflationary costs, escalations, labor shortages as well that demands that we pay more for labor, et cetera. All right, so um, you know, out of our control right now, but doing our best to you know, plan with bureaus, you know, be a little bit more efficient with scopes. Um, and that's just the explanation I have right now. It's just it's pretty much out of our hands. I appreciate putting on the public record. Thank you. Very good. Public testimony? No one signed up. Very good. This is a report. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Gonzalez moves. Can I get a second, please? Second. Commissioner Maps seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank Director Taylor for being transparent and acknowledging the barriers um, that, that are before us with low bid contracting. Um, I also appreciate the conversation today. And um, I also just want to lift up that we've seen um, a market increase in intentionality and um, and the changes to the way that we do business and what we have authority at the city uh, under Director Taylor's leadership. So I want to appreciate him in that respect as well. Um, also, um, in any, it, this is a very old issue for Portland, uh, you know, contracting and, and discrimination or, or uh, challenges in equitable contracting have been, uh, you know, 
such a prevalent issue for such a long time. And uh, my one uh, hope is that we continue to bring in folks from the community like NAMAC and other organizations that have been putting years into this um, into this issue in anything that we, any deliberation we do at the city. So, and, and I'm very supportive of such. So it, for all those reasons, I support it. Um, I, I vote aye. Ryan. Thank you, Director Taylor. That was a great conversation that we just had. Mm -hmm. And I know that we'll have many more to follow up on. And just to put in the public record, although we don't have influence here in my a previous job, it was really made clear that it was also a supply of um, children and youth of color going into the trades mm -hmm. and our education systems um, stigma, if you will, to only say that there's a college, military maybe, and good luck at Walmart. But there was no, um, no it was nothing in the culture that was promoting a pathway to to the next uh, to earn while you learn in the trades to start as the apprentice and move up to the journeyman Absolutely. and become the contractor. So we have to continue to help um, promote that as well because it, it is a supply issue too of um, how to build that that network. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to know, you to know that we're all a part of a very complex ecosystem yes. and that you're a wonderful new addition to the Portland ecosystem to to bring this conversation to a higher level. And I'm hearing that from people in education and from contractors out there. So thank, thank you for your leadership. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Thank you, Director Taylor. I vote aye. Maps. Uh, yeah, I, I thank you, Director Taylor, for your work on this item. Um, and I really appreciate the conversation that we had today. Um, and I want to express that appreciation to my colleagues, too. I do look forward to building that table that brings together uh, procurement, um, public works and uh, government relations to see if we can come up with a legislative fix to this. Um, uh, but in the meantime, I vote aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. Thank you. The report is accepted. Next item, item 119. Accept bid of West Tech Construction Incorporated for the North Settle Road Local Improvement District for $4,688,940. As part of the Port of Port of Portland. It's part of the Portland Bureau of Transportation's North Settle Road Local Improvement District project. This report authorizes work to grade and to construct a street, stormwater, drainage facilities, curbs, and sidewalks on North Settle Road. Director Taylor is here to present this report. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Um, on August, <clears throat> excuse me, on August 30th, 2017. City Council approved ordinance 188576 for the North Settle Road project. Um, that ordinance was later amended to number 189523 on May 21st, 2019. At that time, the engineering estimate was $4.75 million and the confidence level was low on that estimate. Procurement services issued an invitation to bid on October 4th, 2022 with the due date of December 8th 2022, we received three three bids on this project. West Tech Construction was the low bidder and is the recommended awardee. Their proposal came in at 4.688 million, which was roughly one one and a half percent under the budget. Again, the city standard aspirational goals applied that 20 percent applied to this solicitation. Um, we we failed to meet that on this project. We only had 17 percent. Um, certified COVID contractors on this project um, with six and a half percent of that going to minorities. Um, West Tech decided to uh, subcontract 40% of this work um, to majority owned firms. Um, uh, concrete being a prominent uh, portion of the subcontract, 1.7 million to Roger Langelier's construction company. Again, we fall short here, um, Mayor Wheeler and Commission. I'm here to be transparent about that. 45.4% um, of the work will be self-performed by West Tech Construction. Uh, West Tech Construction um, is located in Portland, Oregon, and is not a state COVID certified contractor. It is a white male owned firm. They have a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. The Portland Bureau of Transportation has funds budgeted for this project from FY23 and has proposed uh, additional budgeting um, in FY24 for construction, inspection, and management of this project. If there are any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer them now. 
Commissioner Maps. Uh, uh, thank you, Director Taylor, for that presentation. I have two questions today, one an easy one and one uh, um, a more challenging one. First, the easy one. I think I noticed that this, um, this contract is coming in under the engineer's estimate. Is that correct? That's correct. Any, any uh, um, theory as, as to why this one is under the estimate? Uh, West Tech is one of the more um, strategic projects. They, they've completed quite a few projects for us. From a strategic perspective, they have access to, they have the ability to leverage economies of scale to access materials at a lower cost. I'm imagining um, their pre, pre, previous relationships in the market, ability to hedge and um, you know purchase materials in consortium with other partners uh, was a you know was the driving factor for them to be able to drive their costs down on this project. That's my that's my um, belief here, mm -hmm. um, and we can probably get more granular info from the bid from our chief engineer on the project. Well, I'm glad to see the re result, and I hope there's some lessons there. Now, the the more difficult question uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that we did not meet our minority contracting goals. Um, what, what was the challenge there? Um, again, when West Tech comes to bid, they, they're coming with a proposal to drive cost out of the bid, right? So if you look at um, the breakdown of the bid, you know, the I guess the majority of this bid was probably, their subcontract was probably coming from uh, concrete, right? So, you know, I would imagine West Tech will tell you um, when they solicited bids for concrete um, and paving and boring, they probably didn't get um, competitive uh, bids from the subcontracted community, particularly the minority community. You know, I'm, I'm quite familiar with West Tech and, and I'm almost sure that's what they would say. So um, being that the, the, the predominant portion of the scope of this uh, project was concrete, he would probably tell you that the market did not uh, fare well for minority contractors in that segment. Is there any larger lesson for council here on this? I, I would say that if council, if it's their will that they would pay a premium on projects like this to um, accept bids from minority contractors that were above market, that would be the takeaway, you know? And so, you know, we, we're here to steward funds on the behalf of the taxpayer. This is low bid, the market wins. But that would be the will of city council to lower the threshold on projects that we consider to be low bid, right? And so, um, you know, I think the question is, would you pay a premium for minority participation? Um, and what could be done um, from a policy level to encourage um, low bidders like West Tech and others to uh, be incentivized to include, you know, to in include uh, minorities on these projects? Because we both know that there are minorities out there that can provide concrete. Do we incentivize West Tech to split the bid, et cetera? Again, slippery slope there because this is low bid and we're looking at the market to bring us the best price and that's what the market did. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Director Pico, and I'll just point out to my colleagues that this uh, points to some of the challenges around uh, meeting our equity goals while also um, participating in low bid. I don't have an answer here, but um, I'll point out the fact that we have two items back to back um, that kind of has similar issues, point to the fact that we should probably have some more conversation about how we navigate this space. Uh, thank you, Director Taylor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have no more questions. Um, I just, oh, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, you go ahead. Well, just to build on this theme a little bit, you know, maybe walk us through diversity of workforce and representation in Portland uh, when we're talking about these contractors and what data we're collecting. Because, you know, the, the first layer is minority ownership of the business, and then the second is workforce representation, including at the sub level. Um, and I just am sort of, we don't always often ask that question. It doesn't appear, but but it's it is relevant. So I just you know curious what we know about these in particular, particularly this contract. But the last two we've hit on that. Um, from a workforce perspective, um, I can tell you that this particular contractor is predominantly Caucasian. Um, uh, to Commissioner Ryan's point, we do have a workforce challenge from a diversity perspective in our market. 
Um, as far as numbers go and data goes, um, I was privileged to sit in on a presentation with my colleagues from Prosper. And one of the uh, metrics that jumped out from that economic data was that only 6% of, bi of, of businesses in this market were owned by, by people of color, by black people specifically. So again, you look at that data um, and you look at the ability for a firm like West Tech to partner with um, firms of color and you, 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 you immediately see that their challenges there. But the few firms in the market, the question is, are they getting the work that they, are they at capacity? And so those few firms in the market will probably tell you resoundingly, no, they are not at capacity. So what can we do to make sure that the firms that we do have are, are getting the work that um, is reflective of our commitment in alignment with our core values here in the city? That's the question. If they're not at 110% capacity, we're not doing our job, right? So if they only have a few and they're not at capacity, we have to ask ourselves a tough question. Also, um, and I, I don't want to get into discussions around budget, and I understand that we're in challenging times here. We don't have a, a disparity study that um, provides us with up-to-minute data on our availability of firms. We know that the proliferation of firms, particularly brown and black firms, has grown in the last 12 years. Absent a disparity study, we can, I can't give you uh, concrete data on what the availability of those firms are today. Uh, Ms. Ware, I have a, que a question. Director Biko, is, is there a plan to do a disparity study? Uh, yes, council approved, uh, gave permission for procurement to pursue uh, a disparity study in April. Uh, at that time, uh, we did not request budget. Um, we, re we, we requested budget in the uh, annual request in December. Um, so again, we know that there are uh, budgetary challenges and we're not pushing up against that. Since then, we've looked for grants to help solve our own problem. Uh, but at, at this point, the mitigating factor is budget. You know, we uh, requested 850,000 for a disparity study. Um, confidence is low that that would be approved at this cycle. But we, we move forward, we stay resolute and work with council to uh, find that budget. Um, so, you know, we're working and moving regardless of that. But we know that um, this region needs a disparity study to understand exactly where we are. And we know that the disparity study is the impetus for firm goals. Even if we're not um, in, a, in a season where we're going to uh, put forth firm goals, the disparity study is the, uh, the legal impetus for uh, providing uh, and adjusting our aspirational goals, right? So if we don't have that and we're working on 12-year-old data, um, that's a challenge. But then again, we're positive, happy to continue to move forward and using uh, conclusive contracting methods, partnering with our partners, leveraging the data from Prosper. Uh, but right now, we, uh, we are a bit rudderless uh, on, on the term of what's out there, who's out there, and, um, and having a real quantitative answer and firm answer for, it for the public. Uh, thank you. I forget who's asking the question now. Uh, uh, uh I'll just jump in here. I see Commissioner Rubio is uh, has her hands up too. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Director Taylor, for that background on um, our lack of a disparity study. Um, and here I'm just going to address my colleagues. Um, if you pay attention to the contracting space, this is the lack of a disparity study is an issue we book, we bump up to uh, continually. I believe we've authorized a disparity study. We haven't funded it. Um, it's a bottleneck uh, towards us achieving our equity goals. I know we are operating or going into a budget cycle where things will be constrained. Um, I think I'm basically convinced at this point that the disparity study is something that we should um, embrace despite the fact that um, dollars will be tight. Uh, and I look forward to having that conversation as we um, dive into the budget, next year's budget cycle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll hand the floor back to you and Commissioner Rubio. Very good, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, Rico, I just have a, a couple questions just so that I'm clear. So bringing it back to this contract in particular, um, so there, while acknowledging the sector is, is smaller for, um, for minority contractors that could be subs, they still exist and they do have capacity in this instance. Correct. They do. Um, and, uh, so, this, this is based on, you know, one of the things that, um, I have spent quite a bit of my time on is meeting with, uh, local business owners. And, and they will tell you that they, they are not at capacity. They do not, they are not uh, at capacity from a 
the percentage of their portfolio that's uh, city um, centric. Clearly, we know our subs have other work outside of the city, but the percentage of their portfolio, um, their goals, their sales targets in the city, they're not meeting those sales targets um, in the city of Portland. Okay. And this particular contractor, one of the reasons that they're not using that is because of the low bid and the question about, uh, because it's a it's premium pay and and would essentially create a more expensive project. Right. The criteria set out on this contract is low bid. As a chief procurement officer on a low bid contract, um, it's my assignment to find the best price for, for the taxpayer. And that's what we did. So uh, this particular, although, albeit I will not speak for West, West Tech, um, again, the largest uh, segment, the largest subcontractor uh, portion of the scope of this contract is concrete. So I would imagine if he has a relationship with that subcontractor and they have materials um, that they can leverage, materials purchased prior to what we're, this heavy inflationary period, again, the, from a low, low uh, price perspective, he, he had a solution, a strategic solution, and he wanted to bid on the basis of price. That was the only criteria used to assess, to assess the candidacy of this contractor. Okay, and Biko, would you, um, Director Taylor, would you would you um, agree that um, just so that I'm clear, then our stated values that probably are listed even on our any of our procurement materials are in conflict with indirect conflict with with the impact of low bid uh, procurement. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say they're directly in conflict. I, I would say. We strive to align with our core values, regardless of what type of contract that sure. we're, we're soliciting. Um, to the letter of the law, um, from a COVID perspective, West Tech Construction and others are merely um, adhering to the letter of the law. The 20% aspirational goal for COVID, not 20% aspirational goal for people of color. So right. they are com fully compliant, correct? They are not sitting in juxtaposition of our core values at all because when they bring up a project and they meet the 20% aspirational goal, we're asking them for 20% COVID, not 20% minority. So it's hard for me to say that they, are in, they sit in juxtaposition of our core values or a misalignment. Clearly, it's our will that we're, that we're uh, setting a goal here that's, that could, that probably is not serving the community as, as uh, as well as we could when we say 20% aspirational for COVID, not X percentage, X percentage aspirational for minority. Right, okay. So they're doing thank their job. Well, thank you for um, that clear explanation. I think that was really helpful for me. Thank you, Director Taylor. Commissioner Maps. Sure, uh, um, uh, uh, Director Taylor, uh, thank, I wanna thank you and my colleagues for um, digging into some of the dynamics and dilemmas surrounding uh, contracting. I think this is an important discussion we had today. Um, but I think it's also important that we not lose um, the forest for the trees. Can, can you remind us what this project does? And, and if you're not comfortable, I think I see Andrew in the background too. Like, what are we, what, what does this do? I'm sorry, the, the subtle road project? Yeah, what's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would lean on someone from the Bureau to get into the granular specifics of the project. I, I apologize for that. We have Andrew, you, you, you're good? Can we do just have like a minute and a half to remind us all the benefits that they're gonna come from this lid? Good morning, Commissioner Mapp, City Council, Andrew Abbey, Local Improvement District Administrator. Um, we put this project uh, <clears throat> together. It was called uh, the worst road in Portland. And uh, this was a challenging project to put together. It was a large financial sacrifice from the property owners who are um, paying their hard-earned dollars for the cell ID. Um, the purpose of this project is on several dimensions. One is this is, a, in, this is a freight area with a lot of truck movement and the condition of the road is so poor that it is functionally equivalent to an unpaved street and there's no stormwater management on the street uh, which puts a lot of um, runoff, untreated runoff into the uh, nearby environmentally sensitive wetlands. 
So for that reason, uh, BES is partnering with PBOT financially on this project. I just want to say that we, um, this was also a very challenging uh, project to do the engineering on. We had fabulous staff work done, done to get us to this point. And I'm particularly pleased that after five years, the construction budget is within budget for the property owners. And I just can't stress what a wonderful outcome that is. We typically look at these projects going over budget on the bid. And I'm extremely uh, pleased with the financial outcome of this project. So I hope council will approve this today and award the contract to West Tech Construction. Happy to answer any other questions that council might have. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I'm fine, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for that uh, grounding, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, is there a public testimony? No one signed up. Please call the roll. Mayor, would you like to? Move? I'm sorry. Yes, somebody needs to move. Which so so moved. Support. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get second. a second? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Thank you, Director Taylor, for um, answering all our questions and um, look forward to future discussions around this. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, another great conversation. It's uh, This has been refreshing the last two items to have this dialogue. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank Director Taylor for educating us so much uh, um, today. I also want to thank Andrew for um, his work on this project, which I think extends back five years. Uh, 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 the contracting conversations we had were very important. I think it's also important for us to remember the important uh, um, and desperately needed infrastructure um, improvements that this LID will bring, which is one of the uh, many reasons that I am glad to vote aye. Wheeler. So I obviously I'll support this and I appreciate the hard work that goes into it. And I'm just doing some thinking out loud. As the city consolidates its operations and its bureau operations under a city administrator by the 1st of January in 2025, there'll be more coordination amongst bureaus. And I was thinking to Director Taylor's comments about the conflict between low-cost bid versus developing capacity in our construction companies here locally so that we can actually meet the goals that we have established for our community. And I believe that as that consolidation unfolds, there'll be a clint in some of the work we do there around technical and financial assistance and the work that you do around procurement. And we've somewhat tied your hands in that procurement is a very specific process and it is very narrowly prescribed both by statute as well as ordinance. And uh, there's not a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. that we're giving you here or much room for creativity. And so I want to think a little bit more about that as, as we begin that process of enterprise-wide management. I think there's an opportunity for you to help guide us. So just think on that. That's all I'm asking for today. But it, it's just something that struck me as we were having this conversation. I vote aye, the report's accepted. Thank you. Uh, next item, 120, also a report. Except guaranteed maximum price of $18,077,498 from Stacy and Wintback Incorporated for construction of the Park Lane Park Development Project. So the Park Lane Park Development Project, which is located, of course, in the Centennial neighborhood, covers 25 acres of land, 20 which are undeveloped. That means this is a tremendous opportunity for the city of Portland. The remaining five acres are home to an existing neighborhood park surrounded by single family residences as well as two elementary schools. The community in this neighborhood is highly diverse. There are a large number of children who live in the immediate vicinity and it's economically disadvantaged. Once completed, this project will be the largest and most developed park in the area providing a space for cultural activities, picnic sites for group gatherings, children's play and recreation areas for school use, a multi-purpose field for team sports, as well as room for a large community garden. I cannot stress enough what a positive impact this would have for that party, part of the city. It's a really exciting opportunity. 
and Director Taylor is still with us, okay. still hanging us on uh, to tell us a little bit more about this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, February 12, 2020, City Council approved exemption ordinance 189859 for the Park Lane Development Project. The estimated construction cost at the time was $8.5 million even. The confidence, the confidence level that that was accurate was low. Um, there was outreach on this project. There was a public hearing um, and was advertising the Business Tribune on January 21st, 2020. Um, procurement then issued a request for proposal on February 27th, 2020. Um, there was also a mandatory pre-bid meeting held on March 4th, 2020. And at that pre-bid meeting, seven contractors attended to hear more about the project and how they can compete. The proposal due date was April 9th, 2020, and we received three, three proposals. Emory and Sons Construction Group, Stacy and Whitbeck Incorporated, and James W. Fowler. So seven contractors attended pre-bid, only three bids. Um, were submitted on this project. Stacy and Whitbeck had the highest cumulative score and was a recommended awardee by the Independent Evaluation Committee. Uh, I would like to note that this was not a low bid contract. This was a best value sourcing contract, alternative, alternative bid contract. Um, so we were able to assess the, this, uh, these contractors on more than just price, on more um, criteria than just price. The city's construction diversity and inclusion policy plan applies to this solicitation with a 25% aspirational goal. And the following is a breakdown of the utilization that Stacy and Whitbeck submitted. Um, in total, they submitted a, a, a subcontract plan that had 32% uh, total COVID participation. I'd like to uh, take this moment to uh, provide a few moments, a few points of clarification for the commissioners. Uh, this project was I believe it was our first project executed under the Regional Workforce Equity Agreement. And as a result of that, we were able to utilize a new procurement and inclusive um, program called the Construction Diversity and Inclusion Policy. As a portion of the Regional Workforce Equity Agreement, we know Regional Workforce Equity is primarily a device that is going to help us um, invest in our local workforce and hold general contractors accountable for um, creating more diverse workspaces, leveraging our contract dollar. But there's also a small component of the regional workforce where we're advocating for more contracts to minorities. So if you look at it, um, you, it's a document that's really sitting there to help us leverage our dollar to create more uh, solutions for a diverse workforce, but also to a lesser extent, um, there's a contract equity component is, component there as well that we want to highlight. So this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first contract we're bringing to council under the Regional Workforce Equity Agreement, and I wanted to make that clear. I previously noted that Stacey and Whitbeck uh, submitted a plan for 32% total COVID participation. Of that 32%, 13% were MBE firms, 15% were certified women-owned firms, and 4% were emerging small businesses. So just by default, 13% is not necessarily ground earth shattering, but it shows a marked improvement over the previous low bid contracts that we, we just discussed. Stacey and Whitbeck is located in Portland, Oregon, and it's not a state certified contractor. They have a current city of Portland, city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all the city's contracting requirements. Funds are available in the PPNR system development charge, which is funded through FY23 budgets. I would also like, as a point of transparency, to point out that this project is um, not to exceed at 18.077 million, which is substantially above what the uh, original engineering estimate was of 8.5 million. If you have any questions about the procurement process, I am happy to answer those questions at this time. Commissioner Maps, uh, just a, a quick question, um, and, and we seem to be doing a tutorial on contracting today, but I think it's a, a rich discussion. So there is this interesting contrast that we see today, where we had two low bid contracts, where we struggled to achieve our, our uh, minority contracting goals. Then we have this item um, out of parks, uh, which uses a different contracting mechanism, uh, and we achieved our goals. Um, 
why, well, let me maybe, let me start this way. Um, why and how were we, did we use the, R, I think, RWEA method here as opposed to low bid? So, uh, as uh, uh, the will of the council, council gave us authority to lower the, um, the threshold last year at April from 25 million to 5 million. So at the 5 million threshold, we can implement the regional workforce equity agreement. Council did that. Also in April, council gave us the ability to recognize alternative um, sources for minority certifications. So on this project in our, our construction diversity and inclusion policy, we're recognizing more firms of color and also we're um, leveraging what council did for us to provide best value sourcing criteria that would that are that are more aligned with our city core values. For example, on this particular contract, I believe pricing was 15 percent, 85 percent came in at other factors. So if we look at some of those other factors like uh, corporate responsibility, as a result of council's actions in April, we're able to provide uh, best value sourcing criteria that will incentivize contractors like Stacy and Whitbeck to be more aggressive in their and more comprehensive in their subcontract some subcontract management plans, particularly around diversity and equity. So just by default, by some of the things that council empowered us with in April, we see the numbers are changing here. And not only that, look at the, the breadth of uh, minorities impacted by this project. Even if these projects are not um, putting a dramatic amount of work in each of these shops, we have Native Americans on this project, we have Hispanics on this project, we have African Americans on this project, we have true certified women-owned businesses in this project that were started by women and run by women, Caucasian women, um, Hispanic, African American, Asian, Pacific, Hispanic. So just by council giving us the authority to uh, do this differently, we see that contractors are going to the market and being more aggressive, more comprehensive, and um, more strategic around bringing us plans that serve our community. Okay, and uh, thank you so much for that explanation. And so the, the main difference here is the size of the, so projects over five million, we Correct. can explore this uh, um, um, creative uh, approach to contracting, which seems to be more successful at allowing us to achieve our equity goals. Um, on the other hand, I think the water and PBOT projects that we had today uh, were under $5, five million, million, so we That's didn't correct. have the, this option. Uh, I appreciate that clarification, and I think it's just good information for um, yeah. And this is a regional approach. Where? We're one of 16 partners, um, including Metro, Multnomah County, that are taking this approach. Um, so we have a strong partnership in the region. And using this approach, um, accountability is the, is, the, is the name of the game here. And contractors are coming with uh, more creative ways to, uh, to serve our community and, and be more aligned with our uh, core values here at the city of Portland. And can I ask one more clarifying question? So this, this new approach that we talked about, the uh, RW, Regional Workforce mm -hmm. Equity Agreement, um, it's, this is a, a new approach. This is the first time we've actually implemented it. And I think it kind of occupies the same space that a couple of years ago we might have talked about community benefits agreements. That's correct. This, okay. is, this would be the evolution of a community benefits agreement. Two key components here. One, again, we're one of 60 um, large municipality entities, forgive me if that's not the word, uh, call it what you want, that are you know approaching this the same way. And two, that threshold from 25 million to 5 million is a strategic dif uh, differentiating factor here. And lastly, um, you know, you have to give, uh, you know, we have to acknowledge the, the trades, the unions, for their work on developing, um, you know, a, a community-centric document that put forth really aggressive goals um, for general contractors, and lastly, creating safer spaces for women. So if we're paying a premium here, uh, we're paying a premium for contracts that are going to increase the likelihood of us uh, having diverse workforces and also uh, safer, work for, work, safer workforces for women, workspaces for women, because this document mandates that um, trainer, uh, project managers, um, leaders on construction projects be trained in safe, safe from hate workspaces. So it's a comprehensive document, um, and um, I think it's, it's going to do wonders for our community. 
Thank you, Director Taylor. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments on this report? Do we have public testimony? No one signed up. Please call. Uh, can I get a motion? So moved. Commissioner Maps, can I get second. a second? Second from Commissioner Ryan. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Um, this uh, Centennial neighborhood has been due for a major uh, community park project for many, many years, and the Park Lane Park will be welcomed into this community. Um, I want to thank uh, Director Taylor for um, all his work um, in, in this particular project, and also I'm, I'm really pleased that Park has been an early adopter um, of alternative contracting, and it promises um, a lot more benefits and uh a lot more opportunities for um, equitable contracting in our community um, in years to come. So happy to support this project to keep moving forward and getting construction going and can't wait to see it when it's done. Um, I vote yeah. Bye. Ryan. Yeah, first I just wanna acknowledge that was a great conversation again about procurement and noticing how we went in, we popped it up to a more macro level about the factors that, that aren't being weighed in when we talked about the other two. So. This has almost been like a work session the past three items. And uh, you didn't probably plan on that today, so thank you for enduring it. Um, I had the pleasure of spending uh, a couple hours uh, in this 25-acre park um, because of my role as a parks commissioner now um, two weeks ago. And it was I was kind of blown away by, you know, when you walk out into a 25-acre part of land, you really do notice this big open space. And as Commissioner Rubio noted, it's much needed. Um, for this part of Portland and Centennial neighborhood. The mayor mentioned that in the opening comments as well. I want to thank Sanda Bertos um, for the, the guided tour. Um, it was pretty awesome to know that we're going to be adding some amenities for that neighborhood and especially the, the field. They need fields to, to play in and to play soccer and such. So, um, but my favorite part of the time there uh, was this uh, student of Park Lane Elementary. I assume, because it's right there, um, said uh, she wanted to know what we were doing. So she said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're looking at this park that's going to be built here. She goes, well, what, what did she, how did she say it? She said, um, how old will I be when this park is finished? And I said, well, I don't know. How old are you now? And then she said, well, I'm 10. And then Sandra said, probably she'll be 12. So I was able to then say, well, you'll be able to definitely play her because it's going to be ready by the time you're 12. She got really excited, said, okay, that's good. And then she kept walking. So it was just great to see um, the impact of this park immediately on the children and youth that are in that area and the families that have been, you know, deficient of such amenities. And so I'm excited to vote aye. And congratulations on Thank Parks you. Department, Parks Bureau working with you to, to really hit it out of the park, literally, when it comes to the COVID numbers. Thank you. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Building places for kids to play in East Portland. Love it. I vote aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Rubio for their leadership in bringing a uh, park to this uh, long neglected neighborhood. Um, I want to thank Director Biko for uh, um, the conversations that we had today. Um, and I also really want to underscore um, the innovative aspects of um, this particular procurement item. Uh, we heard that this is the first time that we have deployed our WEA. It's a new innovative approach to uh, um, achieving our equity goals in the, con in the context of contracting. Uh, this is the first time out of the gate. Um, our earlier conversations today also highlighted some of the challenges that we face in the space. This is one of the innovations that we've come up with to try to address these issues. Um, I think this is the first one. I believe we have a couple of others in the, in the pipeline. This is a space I'll be watching very closely. Really want to uh, appreciate and recognize Director Biko uh, Taylor's uh, leadership and innovation in this space. And uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Wheeler. Very happy to support and vote aye. Thank you. The report is accepted. 121, please. This is a second reading. Authorized contract with CBRE Incorporated for $270,000 to provide and, property oops. management services for the city-owned condominium unit at Vanport Memorial Building. Do we have any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 122, an emergency ordinance. 
authorize intergovernmental agreement with Metro and contribute $385,000 for natural area acquisition for protection and restoration purposes. Commissioner Matz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. This ordinance authorizes BES to enter into an IGA with Metro to acquire, preserve, and restore a property that plays a critical role in our region's ecosystem. This property is located at 5631 Southeast uh, 28th Avenue. The purchase price for this property is $770,000, which will be split evenly between Metro and BES. This acquisition is important because Crystal Spring Creek runs through this property. And Crystal Spring Creek is a major tributary for Johnson Creek. Uh, Crystal Spring Creek is 2.4 miles long and offers critical habitat for birds, wildlife, and three kinds of fish which are protected by the Endangered Species Act. For more than a decade, environmental services and more than 20 different partners have been working to enhance conditions in this creek for the benefit of native fish and wildlife and to improve water quality. Uh, the ordinance before us today it is an important part of that effort. Today we have two staff members from BES to tell us more about this project. We have Shauna Anderson, an environmental specialist with BES, and we have Virginia Bowers, property coordinator with environmental services. Uh, welcome team BES. Thanks very much. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Shana Anderson with BES. Thanks for the opportunity to bring this to council. Um, as Commissioner Maps noted, the city of Portland and Metro have overlapping interests regarding the protection of water quality, restoration of streams and wetlands, and mitigation for climate change. Within the city of Portland, Metro and BES have invested in areas to protect Johnson Creek, the East Buttes, and the Columbia Slough. And to that end, Metro and BES have drafted this IGA for your approval that addresses roles and responsibilities with respect to the acquisition, management, maintenance, and operation of future natural areas in the city of Portland. At this time, could I please ask the council clerk to share the graphic for this item? Uh, so the second piece to this story is that the very first acquisition under this IGA would be the property located here at 5631 Southeast 28th. It is uh, shown on the map as the lot that's outlined in hash marks. And as the commissioner mentioned, this is an important stream, a critical stream for the city of Portland uh, in terms of its water quality and habitat for endangered species listed salmon. It uh, also gives us the opportunity to address temperature targets in the city's tax total maximum daily load implementation plan, as well as actions in the city's climate emergency work plan. Um, in addition to Metro, there's potential for partnerships with Reed, the Rhododendron Garden, Crystal Springs Partnership, the Johnson Creek Watershed Council, and the East Multnomah County Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, Crystal Springs is also culturally significant to the indig indigenous community who participate in a yearly salmon celebration here. Um, there is a house on the property which we plan to retain as um, housing by conducting a land division on the site to partition off that structure with a small yard that's shown approximately in red on the graphic. We would then surplus the house to sell on the open market. This is a strategy BES is using at other sites in the city to con conduct restoration activities without removing housing from the city's inventory. And it also enables BES and its partners to recoup some of the funding that goes into the initial property acquisition. This is an emergency ordinance in order to complete the time sensitive acquisition of the Crystal Springs property. Um, and with that, I thank you very much for your time and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? I'm not at seeing any. Do we have any public testimony? No one signed up. Very good. This is 
an emergency ordinance, please call the roll. Rubio. Securing natural land is an important piece of our climate work um, as we continue to work to keep our waters clean and restore habitat for our native wildlife and plant life, and, especially, and specifically our endangered species that we heard about um, uh, of salmon who thrive in this habitat. So I want to thank Commissioner Maps and BES uh, staff for the co great collaborative work with Metro and others to help restore these natural important areas in our city. For these reasons, I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, great presentation. Um, I vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, we, I know this property well. This is in my neighborhood. Uh, by way of background, that uh, family had lived in that house for over 100 years. It was uh, relocated from a portion of Eastmoreland Golf Course by uh, the owner's father, I think, at the end of the 19th century, uh, in, in early 20th centuries. Uh, we actually helped her uh, deal with some homeless issues on the property uh, this summer. So I'm very happy to see it uh, moving into uh, a more stewardship oriented uh, ownership model. And for that reason, I vote aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank staff, staff at BES for uh, their work on this project. And I also want to express my appreciation uh, for folks at Metro for partnering with us on this. Uh, I also really appreciate Commissioner Gonzalez's background um, on this particular item. Um, I happen to know this space quite well too. Um, and I suspect a lot of Portlanders do. The creek that we're talking about is the creek that runs through the Reed College Canyon. So if you've ever had the privilege of walking through there, uh, you know what an, inc an incredible natural space that is, I've known that space literally for my entire life, and I think one of the, uh, uh, it is one of the most remarkable um, habitat restoration programs that I've seen in the last 30 years. I can remember what it was like in the 1980s. Now, if you go down there, you can literally see salmon um, in the creek and beavers, and it really is uh, um, just a wonderful, uh, um, it's a wonderful, special Portland place. I'm really proud of the fact that this city can be involved in helping preserve that. Um, uh, important natural resources for uh, generations to come, which is one of the many reasons why I'm proud to both sponsor this item and vote aye. Wheeler. Good project, should be done, I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 123 is second reading. Authorized contract with Diameter Services Incorporated for owner representative support services for the advanced metering infrastructure project using a sole source procurement and provide for payment for $5,464,248. Colleagues, any further business on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Yeah, we got to catch up with the industry and the other utilities. And really, when the most compelling thing I heard, which I've experienced before, is you don't know you have a leak until you get your bill. And so how wonderful that someone can monitor that data. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Water and BES for their work on this item. Uh, this is a, this is going to be a great project. Uh, pretty soon, f folks will be able to have an app on their phone that will show their water usage in real time. It will help you find leaks. It will help you conserve water. Um, it basically moves our city and our utilities into the 21st century. Uh, very proud to be part of this project, which is why I vote aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Last but not least, item 724 also is second reading. Revised bid solicitation and contracting for the Washington Park Hypochlorite Facility Improvements Project to reconfirm budget availability and reflect the adjust, adjusted estimate. Any further discussion? I'll just uh, say this. Um, in a time of inflation, it's necessary. The estimates were early on. Things have obviously changed in terms of construction costs. Uh, so my view is this is a uh, not only a reasonable step to take, it's necessary. Please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I, first, I appreciate uh, the mayor's context on this particular project. Uh, this is incredibly important for everyone who lives and works on the west side of the river and needs to drink clean, uh, safe water. Um, this project will help us deliver that, which is why I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.